You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I remember my mum one day told me how my dad, I was crying in the cot and my dad was like this bang, bang, bang to shut me up. Um, and that was when I was a, a kid in the car. I don't know my age, but I was in the car. So that was my dad. My dad had his own stuff that he needed to deal with. And when you look back at him now, because as people could listen to the story, they could be like, oh, what, your dad's this and that. But then I got to understand my dad and found out that his mum used to beat him and getting into crime because you listen to the streets. You know, the mindset, everyone's talking about road man, this and that, but the streets steals your potential. The streets offers you a few options and job opportunities. The street says rob someone, take their stuff. The street says soulless drugs, poison your community. The street says do all these different things, but none of it actually develops your character and you as a person. So I bought into that and thought this was the way that I could make money. But by the time I was 21 and I looked at my life, I'm there sucking on a crack pipe all night. And then I'm, I'm there thinking, I wake up, I missed the whole day because I, I was asleep from about seven and woke up in the night again. And I thought, what the hell, man? What kind of life is this? I had a dream when I was a youth. I wanted to be someone. I believed in myself then. What's happened to that? And uh, going in to see him in, in the room, um, bro. Um, that's never, ever going to um, leave leave my head. That, that feeling of just seeing him looking peaceful and then looking at his arms, you could see the, the knife where he'd been trying to block it. Um, and just one got through in his heart, just one. I was so broken. I'd never seen so many tears and you can imagine I've, I know how to cry now. But I'm broken, I'm crying. There's a puddle on the floor. Like how all this water's dripping, it was way more than that. I was just break and I cried out to God like, like what now, I give up. I, bruv, I was so plagued from revenge and anger that it felt like it was, it was taking my life. The, my life force was being sucked out of me because I was dreaming about killing him, waking up, you know, thoughts have come from my head during, I'm talking to you, but I'm thinking about killing Hannah, you know, you don't even know. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Mark Prince, yes, OBE. Man. How are you, brother? I'm excellent, man. It's really good Such to see you. It's an honor to be here with you, man. It's an honor to be sitting across from you. Yeah. You're d doing fantastic work, amazing work. Thanks, man. Professional boxer, fighting yeah. in the ring for world titles. And mm -hmm. you lost your son, sadly, 2006. Yeah. yeah. From a uh, murder. He was only 15. QPR mm -hmm. prodigy. But what the work you've done now is relentless to now help others help yeah. bring down knife crime mm. it's phenomenal the achievements that you've done it's it's very yeah. brave as well to kick on especially obviously it can be hard it can be destructive mm. but you haven't let it defeat you you're now here fighting and you're still trying to help others it's mm. a beautiful thing brother yeah bro how are you i'm just feeling really grateful today man really grateful um driving down with my wife down here i just felt this joy and this peace as I was going on my journey. And then I was um, thinking about my journey and how long, what I've been through to get here and um, how tough it's been, you know? And I was listening to this song, Yet Still I Rise by Yolanda Adams. And I was thinking, wow, you was, like there was a time I remember I was going through so much in my life. You know, my, my, my first marriage was breaking down, my son was killed and and I sang this song like from my gut, you know, yet still I rise. And and I didn't know where that came from, but I meant every word of it. Didn't know what the future held for me, but that was me fighting back. And I, I didn't realize how powerful um, that was gonna help me for the future. The words that I was singing, 
the, 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 those words I was singing, I believed in it, that I was going to rise. And uh, that was just a little flashback in my head as I was in the car coming down thinking, wow, you know, I think we have to be really careful what we're saying and even what music we're listening to because you're feeding your soul with stuff. And I think the music I was feeding my soul with was really important. Anthony Hamilton's album, Ain't Nobody Worrying. Uh, I was feeding my soul with some music and mm -hmm. telling myself things that was going to have a big impact in how I was going to move myself forward yeah. through these Music's issues. a massive, powerful thing that it can send you both ways. It plays with your emotions. Oh, it's different straight. things. And if you can, I li when I'm out running, I listen to mm. motivational stuff. It's got like music through it. I'm just constantly feeding the mind. The mind yeah. is like a sponge. So I would rather listen to that. I used to listen to a lot of rap music, Two Pack, The Game, no 50 doubt. Cent, Snoop yeah. Dogg, Nas. Yeah, but it's 100. all about violence. And sometimes if I'm in the gym, I will throw that on for time to time. But I tend to come out and I feel fucking angry. Like, like, bro, yeah. It's different music for different yeah, occasions, yeah. isn't it? Different emotions that yeah. you need. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> when I used to fight on Frank Warren, I was a light heavyweight with Frank Warren. I used to come out, he used to say, look, you're going to have to take down some of that music because the, the music was like hip hop and it was, it was aggressive and it just mm -hmm. made me like, yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> do something. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's what was that's, needed yeah. at that time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you go in the gym, you need something hype. Yeah. to get you going to get mm -hmm. through the mad training sessions yeah. that you're going to have to go through because motivation isn't there 24-7 which we'll touch on later on in the, on the podcast of course but I always go back to the start with my guest brother yeah. where all you grew down. up and how it all began yeah yeah where I grew up uh, <laughs> Wood Green uh, Wood Green and Tottenham was my haunts uh, my areas and um, it's crazy growing up because um, I think the first thing I noticed that sort of made me wonder and question things was just how you're treated by others when you're growing up. So firstly, outside of my home, what impacted me was just how uh, white people treated me, like the way they would touch my hair and, oh, you don't have to comb your hair. And like, little did I realize that the ignorance in people, what they were taught about people of color, you know, black people and how they looked after their self and um, thought that we didn't comb our hair, we didn't do this. It was what was taught to them. So that's what I got from them. And then you see, as I got a little bit older, I'd notice, you know, sometimes you see a woman sort of like draw herself in, hold her bag on the bus when you'd get on the, you know, on the top deck. And I'd sort of look at them like, what? What are you acting like that for? And then you'd, you'd, you'd know why. You'd yeah, realise why. She was why. scared that she was going to get saying? robbed so Exactly, yeah. like, just this set mindset that was already taught that, that, you know, black guys are aggressive, they'll rob you and stuff like that. And um, you become resentful, you know, you become resentful of the police because you're just going home from taking your shopping back. You're 10 years old, you go around the corner to the shop, feds pulling up on you treating you like you're some big criminal. All you got is a bag with sugar and eggs to go back home to your <laughs> mom and they're going through your bag. You nick yeah. this. Boom. And you're like, so you, you kind of grow up on the streets with this, you, you kind of gain this knowledge and understanding how the world perceives you and you get angry with the world for how they're looking at you and you know that's not who you are. And then when you go inside your house, you're dealing with fear because you got a lovely mom, lovely dad, you know, a dad that you really look up to, You've got your two brothers and your sister, older sister, older brother, and then one younger brother. And it's fun, it's great, it's lovely. You know, them times, um, the, the, the whole process was, you know, respect for your parents, respect for your elders, respect for authority. The times I grew up, that was in place. Uh, but it was strange because we got more beats then than any time in, 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 in history when you look at how kids are dealt with and brought up by their family. And I think it was the result of that Jim Crow mentality that was, you know, slave mentality that was passed through through the parents. You you get beaten for everything. You're, you're told you're less than. So that's, that's, that's placed inside your psyche. So even when you got your children, you're doing the same thing to them. And when you hand out punishment, it doesn't fit the crime. You know, my dad was handing out brutal beatings where your skin was 
coming off because of the end of the skipping rope would take that top bit of skin off and you'd have big swellings and your T-shirt would stick to the cuts and um, you'd be going to school like that. But that's your world from home that you're in. They don't really know about it. Um, and, and you go to school and people wonder why you can switch and get mad. Like I remember this, I was playing football in the playground and someone kicked the ball right down to the other end of the playground. And, and I ran all the way to the end of the playground and some guy about, I don't know, two, three years above me must have kicked the ball all the way back down the end. So I'm like, what? I ran all the way up here for the ball and, and you've kicked it all the way back down. I banged him up. Like, what kind of a mindset is that? It's like, I would switch if you took the piss out of me. I'll be known to end up having a ruck with my own mate, you know, because of the way that I was getting dealt with at home, hurting people hurt people. So I was hurting others based on my own anger and based on, you know, me just wondering why am I getting treated like this by my dad that's supposed to be loving me and caring for me. And I look up to him, you know, like he's yeah. the Hulk, like there's some mm -hmm. great man. Yeah, so you were conditioned to, violence yeah. was normal at that time. So you I, thought I if you so. were being violent towards, then you could be violent towards other people. Oh, I think so, because that was my way of dealing with stuff because I yeah. got taught that's the way of dealing with stuff. Yeah. There's an issue, beat and, and cause punishment yeah. and pain. It's sad that kids can be conditioned from a young age to think that's normal. And then yeah. you accept it and that's where the anger, frustration, the abandonment issues, yeah. everything kicks in and that's where you feel the fire of becoming so angry and full of hate and rage, racially totally. abused, people thinking that you're going to mug them, your dad beating you. You think, is this what the world's about? Is this Bro, what life's about? And so it's can you not. see how, how sometimes we look at people and we judge that their behaviour, yeah. but we do not see what's actually going on in their everyday life. Yeah. And in my everyday life, there was a lot of pain there was a lot of fear. So it's, I'm going through emotional and mental abuse, I'm, you know, physical abuse, because my, my skin's getting damaged and harmed. And, and how is it affecting me when I'm seeing my sister being beaten? Because sometimes my dad would tell you to take off your, your clothes and to see my sister having her clothes taken off, to, that, I, was, I was a broken little boy. Mm -hmm. You know, that used to have me, I used to cry more seeing my brothers and my sisters getting beaten than I would for me. How old were you? Uh, I can remember some vicious beatings from, from a young age. I remember my mum one day told me how my dad, I was crying in the cot and my dad was like this bang, bang, bang to shut me up. Um, and that was when I was a, a kid in the cot. I don't know my age, but I was in the cot. So that was my dad. My dad had his own stuff that he needed to deal with. And when you look back at him now, because as people could listen to the story, they could be like, oh, what, your dad's this and that. But then I got to understand my dad and found out that his mum used to beat him. And his mum used to beat him so bad, she'd send him in the river. But in the river, is dangerous. My dad's in, in Guyana. He's from Guyana. So there's crocodiles and there's pythons and shit like that. So he's not only got you know, all this pain he's dealing with, he's shit scared because he's in this river thinking, shit, what's gonna, what could come out and get me? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he's dealing with a lot himself and he didn't break his cycle. So he, I, he started a journey for me and I had to learn to break my cycle. Yeah, you need to break the connection. It can, bring your, yeah. it can actually bring your DNA where, like, I've got uncles and stuff and for, uh, who are bad gamblers and they've been addicted. I've had aunties who've been alcoholics, I've got uncles who gamble, there you go. Um, some on drugs. It can be in your DNA where it passes down. So I wanted, including myself, when I was, yeah. a, I had so many fucking addictions, I'm thinking, where, why am I like this? So wow. I started understanding the mindset yeah. and understanding the connection. It can actually be in your DNA, it can pass down I'm the chemical you, things, chemical imbalances, yeah. It becomes and you must break the link or your kids become a reflection of you. Exactly right, and I didn't want that. Yeah. It's like, from when I was a little boy, I don't know what I had in me, but I knew I wanted a really good relationship with my dad. I just wanted, you know, I knew it was my dad, but I wanted, I wanted this beloved. friendship and this, yeah. this love and acceptance from my dad because I saw him as a just a strong, lovely man. He was so popular out there. People loved my dad. Every time I went out with him, 
we couldn't get from one place to the other where my dad wasn't seen by someone who called him out, yo, Prince. And they'll be standing up there chatting for ages. I'll just be sitting there like this, not doing what these kids do, pulling their yeah. parents, come on, wanna go? Mate, you had respect. You just mm -hmm. waited and, you know, your, your it's dad's a great talking name. your mum. It's a great name. Yeah, it's a powerful yeah, name, totally Prince. Very powerful. Yeah. So when you started going through school, think, thinking yeah. you're abandoned and yeah. you're bullied mentally, physically, what was your, did you become really angry at secondary school and yeah. fighting every day? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Fighting was, uh, getting into fights a part of my life. I love the aggression. I love one bounce beats football. Um, I just loved anything that was contact and that's why sports was made for me. You yeah. know, football, I was probably a bit too aggressive in football. <laughs> uh, you just love going in yeah. for the tackle and end up being the, the goalkeeper at school because diving, <laughs> just anything rough, yeah. you know, I love doing. Um, and then, and then I, obviously I started running away from home because I never had that mindset where I'm going to take this. Some people's is where they'll accept things. Even from 13, I just was not going to accept because I realised my dad was effing up my brain with all of this way of dealing with things when I had, when I knew he was a really nice guy, but he had this other side to him. And then I had my mum and I didn't want to hurt my mum because my mum just was such a devoted, awesome lady. And um, I just wanted to make my mum happy. So when I got caught, when I ran away the first time and I was in class and social services must have came out, I don't know how they found out that I ran away, but um, it must have been for about two days and then they found me. Um, I, tried to, I tried to sleep at my mate's house. His mum came up and found me in his room and get out, kicked yeah. me out at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I'm walking around the street, waiting for, to get into school for about eight. I was too scared to find anywhere to sleep. Stayed up, um, yeah, and, and that, well, that was tough and that was scary too. Is that why you were running away because you didn't want any more pain? I didn't want no more pain, bro. I didn't, and I, what was doing it? It's like somehow I could get over the pain, and um, because my brother and sister used to say, "How do you do that?" My dad used to come with a skip roll and say, "Ooh, first," and I'll stand up and go, "I'll, I'll go first. And they'll look at me like, what the, is this guy nuts? And they all talk about it now, like, how was you doing that? But my mindset was like, let's get this out of the way. I'm going to go through pain. And then it got to the point where my dad was giving me these beatings and I wasn't crying. I was taking the beats. Did that annoy him? Probably, probably, because I was first, he was fresh. Yeah. So we could release, you mm -hmm. know, what he had. When did you start understanding your dad's background? Uh, what probably, age? Probably when I was a lot older. Probably yeah. when I started boxing at 21. And what's strange is it was him that I started, that I started boxing with. Because he, he, a part of my life growing up was training. Come running. So he just say, follow me. He said, follow you. You follow him. You don't stop. You just keep running. He's running, you run. And you come home, you teach how to spar, you had your feet, set your hands, because he knew what it was like out there on the street. He knew the challenges for a young black boy and he didn't want his son to be a victim. He wanted his son to be able to take care of himself. So he taught us how to take care of ourselves. Was so we were known. To toughen you up, a tough love uh, kind of mentality, but uh, so uh, brutal, it's a bit too much. Was he doing it thinking it was going to benefit you at any stage? Well, I think there's two stages to this. One is my dad's, uh, inability to control, have self-control and control his anger. The other one was the great guy that wanted to teach his, his, his boys how to defend theirself. So in doing that, he set a program. Every day you come from school, you come in, you do skip, you do your, 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 your cardio work, you do your, your training, do some boxing, spa together, whatnot. So we, that was our life growing up. And sometimes if dad came home and you weren't sweating enough, you were skipping while everyone else was eating dinner and you'd be watching them at the dinner table while you're mm. still outside in the back garden yeah. still training because you weren't sweating enough. Mm. What age did you start getting into boxing? Um, apart from growing up, being around my dad, I never ever went to a gym, never thought about being a boxer. I just thought this was life. And um, after spending, like after I finally got to run away from 15 and stayed away, um, and that was just a really rough time because what it is, you find company of um, of the wrong sort because because 
people want to introduce you to stuff when you're vulnerable, but they don't know you're vulnerable and you don't know you are. You're just a young boy coming up and you think, yeah, I'm a man now, I'm out on my own. Mm. So you're rolling with guys, they're older than you, uh, introducing you to bunning, you're smoking your spliff, and then you go from that to start to take ease. Ease was the in thing, acid tabs, so you're hallucinating and it's mad experiences with that. It's all in there, love it powerful book just sharing all the experiences of those six years when I was just like unfocused in the wilderness and basically using other bad habits to cover my pain and to and to and getting into crime because you listen to the streets you know the mindset everyone's talking about road man this and that but the streets steals your potential the streets offers you a few options and job opportunities. The street says rob someone, take their stuff. The street says soulless drugs, poison your community. The street says do all these different things, but none of it actually develops your character and you as a person. So I bought into that and thought this was the way that I could make money. This was the way I was, because by the time I was 21, I had Tanisa and I had Cayenne. So I had two kids and I had my first child when I was um, 18 years old. So it kind of changed and shifted my mindset and made me think I'm not just responsible for me, I've got to take care of my little girl, my little princess and make her proud. But by the time I was 21 and I looked at my life, I'm there sucking on a crack pipe all night and then I'm, I'm there thinking, I wake up, I miss the whole day because I, I was asleep from about seven and woke up in the night again and I thought, what the hell man, what kind of life is this? I had a dream when I was a youth. I wanted to be someone, I believed in myself then. What's happened to that? And I actually had a conversation with myself and asked myself some questions. Like, what are you doing? Where's this taking you? Do you want to go jail? Could you deal with a bird? You know, and I started to look at my own future. And that was a really important conversation. Hence why I kind of phrase this term when I'm dealing with youth. And I say, have a word of yourself. Because... Because the counsellor don't have the answers. You got the answers. You just need to ask yourself the right questions. And that's why I got into life coaching in the future because I realised it's about questions. We've got the answers in us for our own future and what we need. So I began to ask myself these questions. Do you really want to be away from your kids? No one's going to be able to commit crime all their life and not get caught and something doesn't happen. There's always consequences for our actions. So... I wanted to change the direction of my life at 21. So I thought to myself, what can I do? And I thought about going to uni. Um, I thought about, you know, just getting a job, a warehouse job. But for some reason, I just felt that there was more about me than just going in to get a job. And I thought, I'm known to fight on the street. People know I can fight. So why not go into boxing? And um, I said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to box. But when I shared that, with people, and, and sometimes I wanna I want share this with people. When you share your vision with other people, trust me, don't share it to get any sort of uh, company and assurance and an agreement, because it's yours. It's not for anyone else, it's for you to believe in. It's your belief that's gonna drive it, not people's belief in you. So. I realised that people were kind of knocking me like, but Prince, you, you bun too much weed, bro. You, you, you know, you're a little ganja baby. You, you know, look, you, you drink and you're this and you're that. And these guys have been fighting since they've been little kids, 10, 12 years old. You're 21, bro. How are you going to beat man that's been fighting all their life? And, you know, you, you're too old to start the game. And all of those things could have knocked me, bro. They could have knocked me. But I just had my blinkers on. And I'm just, you know, someone's out there listening and needs to know that they're enough. They're enough. Their belief is enough for what it is that they want to do when they want to recreate their life. Because at 21, I decided to recreate myself, come off the roads, all the habits in the company, all the stuff that I love doing every day that I thought, you know, was fun, you know, was really in reality taking the quality and the potential away from me. The minute I got and made a decision to stay focused on something and to have a drive and to work towards that, 
I think things began changing yeah, for me. Yeah, life's a beautiful thing, and it's, it's great that you touched powerful. on putting the blinkers on because it's your dream. Anybody watching, it's their dream and vision. If you yeah. tell your mum, your dad, your best friend, they can project their fears onto yeah. you. And when you start focusing on your dream and going to your path, people don't like you either because they think, he can do that, but why can't I? So That's a lot of resentment right. comes, but again, it's just to put the blinkers on, stay focused and go. understand that anything can be achieved. Powerful Ooh. thing. Also, there is a 60% connection from childhood trauma and addiction. Straight. The addiction is, it's just escaping from the fucking pain, the misery, doing, the torment, the, the torture. It's just hiding. But from 21 years, you only started boxing, but you then fought for world titles and then By won the belts. In, in the next what? seven seven years seven eight years why so fast did you move through the ranks um i remember at first i thought okay how do i do this how do i get into boxing how do i start what do i do then i found out that when i got in the gym they talked about doing amateurs and i thought so why don't i create a plan well, I find out, because sometimes you got to find out for yourself if you've got delusions of grandeur mm -hmm. or you really are, you know, the, the real deal. So um, I decided, let me let me fast track myself through amateur fighting and see what I'd be like. So after like four fights, and I won the four, um, the, one of the guys at my gym, um, I think Martin, said... Prince, I think there's something about you. you could do this. Why don't you enter into the ABAs, which is the biggest amateur competition in the country? And uh, I was like, yeah, cool. You know, that worked for me because it was gonna it was gonna help me to find out whether I was the real deal or not. So I went into the ABAs as a novice. I was supposed to go into the novice championships. Mm -hmm. I bypassed that and went into the the proper thing with uh, with the top boys in the country. Uh, and challenged the top 10 fighters for the Northwest Division. That was my area. Then whoever won that, you went on to go on to the London titles. Then whoever went won that, you went on to win the whole of uh, England and Wales and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a process I went on. So that was my dream now was I'm going to win the ABAs. And I found out in the local papers one day that, that the numbers of fights that I had, if I won them, I'll be in the Guinness Book of Records for winning the ABAs in the shortest amount of fights. So I was like, yes, boy, yeah. that's Something me. Something they fight for. Yeah, that's <laughs> me. So um, I was deep on this journey and I had so much challenges through the amateur ranks that really demonstrated my mindset. One of the first ones I want to share is being in with Kenny Nevers, who was like a really top light heavyweight. The, I watched Kenny... I had so much respect for him. In fact, I love this style. His left hook was awesome. And um, he scared me because I watched him. I was at ringside watching because them days you had, to, you had to fight like three times before you won the title on the same night. So you fought, you went back, um, you know, the others went through, then you find out who you're fighting next. So it was all in, all in one evening. So I'm waiting and I'm watching these guys who my competition is. I'm with my older brother. We're sitting there. And what does it feel like when you watch your older brother in awe of a guy and looking at you like this? Like, oh, <laughs> shit, oh <laughs> shit, bro. Uh -huh. And my brother looked at me and he was like, you're going to have to fight him, my brother. <laughs> you know, and then he was like, um, it, I could feel the fear and the doubt mm -hmm. in him. And um, and I and it it, it kind of rubbed off clang, on you. It clung yeah. on to me. Mm -hmm. It clung on to me, and um, and then I just thought because remember I I grow up in fear, so you know I wasn't this brave fighter smashing everyone up like Mike Tyson. Like, yeah, yeah. Because even Mike was had fear as well. Fear, so yeah. you know people feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. So it was my turn, and he won his fights, and I won mine. And it was us together. But the fight I had, the last fight I had, I smashed my hand. So my hand was swollen. So that was my get out clause. Mm -hmm. That was like, hey guys, look at the state yeah. of my hand. It looked like a pillow mm -hmm. and it was difficult to get in the glove. But what happened is we, we got a few of us surrounded me because officials were around and I didn't want them to see that my hand was injured. So kind of, we they were around me, we put the glove in and I was like, ah, mm -hmm. pushing my hand in this glove because it was small and tight. Mm -hmm. So we got our hand in there and my dad gave me this, um, this strategy to beat this guy because he'd been watching him too. 
And he said, listen, son, this guy's got one hand. He's a one-handed fighter. And what my dad calls a one-handed fighter is because he only really had a great left hook. Left hook. He didn't really have mm -hmm. much else. And he, he got it so locked, he'd been winning on that. So my dad said, go the other way. He said, don't use the swole hand. Just keep breaking him down, double the jab, triple the jab, just keep it in his face. So I was like, cool. And I, and I saw, I realized later that I was a good student because I was able to really take on instruction. And I followed that to a T. And I watched Kenny Nevers, I looked in his eyes and I saw frustration and I saw him getting irritable. And then it went from there to I saw his heart breaking. And when I saw Kenny's heart breaking, like it was also, it was in the second round now. And I think it was going into the third round. And then um, I, I, it's like I forgot about the pain. I just started opening up on him two-handed because once I saw that his mind, I took his mind, that was it, bro. Because he couldn't catch me. I was moving, his face was doing this all evening, mate. So once I'd done that, bang, bang, jumped in, the ref jumped in, stopped it, fight was over, bro. Listen, that was an amazing <laughs> uh -huh. victory because it was all about the mind. Mm -hmm. There was so much battle, it was way more than the fight. You know, people look at the outcome, but if you look at the battle that's going on inside of you, that's where your success is. Mm -hmm. That's where the victory is. People are looking for stuff outside to show the mark of success. It is inside. The victory is about you, what you've accomplished and what you've overcome. And for me, I was a champion in the world that evening, bro. How you old know? were you? I was 21 years old. And how was your dad then? Was he proud of you? Did they show oh, much love or emotion for oh, you? Oh, listen, my dad was the proudest man on the planet. I think he had a chance to live out his life again through watching me. He, he was my biggest fan. He used to come to the gym, watch me fight. But I still had this pain inside of me from growing up. He never came to me and explained anything. He never apologized. I hadn't forgiven him. You know, that was still there. That was the elephant in the room always. And elephants in the room always affect how you deal with people and how you feel about people. So because that wasn't tackled, um, dad seeing me being in the gym, chatting with my mates, ah, oh, fucking this and that, talking, laughing, whatever. Dad weren't used to that. So he was in an environment where his son's grown. Remember, I ran away from him from 15. He ain't really mm -hmm. been around me since then. And he can't accept that I'm this man now. He loves what I'm doing. He can live his life. But he's trying to deal with me like I'm still this little kid at home. And I weren't feeling it. Mm -hmm. So I was old enough now. So I was letting him know, nah, bro, I ain't feeling Did that. Did you address the situation as you got older? Uh, only to the point at 21 where I said, nah, I think we need to like, ease off this relationship and then I didn't have dad as a trainer and I was training by myself and then Eric Seacom came along Michael Watson's trainer and saw me and thought this guy is amazing and my first sparring session was with Michael Watson in Tottenham Enterprise he's another great guy Michael yeah Michael's awesome and um, once he sparred with me he came to me he was the first to, to tell me you're going to be a champ one day you're going to make it you're going to do really mm. great but my dad, I hadn't dealt with stuff until later, years later. That was around 92. And around 97, 98, I began starting to deal with the issue with my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Working with him. Yeah. Trying to make yeah. the changes. Definitely. And then when you started moving through the ranks, because you were one of the British most up and coming young yeah. fighters at the well, time. Were you yeah. 18, 18 and 0 and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I've got to 18 and 0. And then. Your world title fight? I had a world title fight. I shouldn't have fought that world title. Um, at the time, but my trainer really pissed me off. Um, we, we had a meeting with, with Frank Warren and, um, you know, in the car, there was certain advice given to me from my trainer about, you know, how, what to say, how to deal with the situation, um, you know, for the offers that were coming up because I was supposed to fight Chris Eubank and uh, two, two weeks away, I was so gassed about it. I was like, yes, like I watched these men and now I'm gonna fight them there. Mm. And um, when we went in, you know, Carly always said, don't, every fight could be your last. Make sure you get paid right. So I was 
I kind of offered money that I didn't agree with, that I was worth a lot more than that. So based on what my trainer advised me, and, and he had 50% managership of, of the contract with Frank. And um, he, he, for me, he didn't step up. You're supposed to, I'm the fighter, take care of business. Yo, I gave you that managerial spot to do that. So even though me and Carly, we love each other, we're blessed, and we came back in 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 2000 and what was it? Was it 15? And we, we had a, a comeback because I made a comeback in 2013. So I found Carly again in 2015. He's still an ex excellent trainer. Any fire under him, he should have been a top guy and known, but you know, he, he, he had his own stuff to deal with, but he was a great guy. But at that time, I did not love the way that we dealt with that situation. And I didn't feel managed right. I didn't feel looked after. And because of that, we messed up the opportunity to, to fight Chris Eubank. And um, sometimes I sit down and think, man, Frank said it. Frank said, just trust me. You know, don't worry about the money this time. Next time, we're going to drop some more on you, whatnot. And uh, I just had Carly, because he had such a powerful influence over me. He, you know, it was like a little bit like a father figure in a way, the way he helped to develop you as a fighter and as a man. So he had that power over me, and I went with him instead of going with what Frank said and um, I missed out on my opportunity, yeah. man. What was fight. it like after your first defeat? It was actually, actually brilliant. After my first <laughs> defeat, it was awesome. It was like mm -hmm. nothing like what I thought. You know, I thought I got to protect my zero. You know, I could never, it's going to ruin my career. If I have, if I don't, if I have a loss, none of the above. I, it really taught me about life. It really taught me that, bro, what, what you think you're just going to go through life and the sun shines on you all the time. Bro, this is life. This is it, bro. Losing, winning, failing, success, all of it. This is life. Get up and become better every single time you drop. And that was my biggest lesson for, for that. Because formerly, you're trying to play this part that you're this, you know, the greatest fighter, zero on your record. Fun that, brother. I come into this. It's a short business. You make your money. You represent with yourself giving 100% in every fight and let the chips fall where it may. Because anything can happen in any fight. You know, a guy could flip in, look that way, know you're coming in, bang, and touch you on your chin, you're gone. Like, anything can happen in the fight game. So it made me a better fighter because I fought one of the best fighters in the world at the time, um, Darius Mikulczowski, and lost in the, I think it was the eighth or ninth round. I was exhausted, sparked. I didn't even want to go into the build up to that fight and the preparation. Um, but but I learned so much and it made me better. It yeah. made me a better fighter. Losing to Darius made me a better fighter. So I went up in weight because I was killing myself at Cruiser 12 and a half. I was killing myself at 12 and a half stone. Like, I was what, 6'2 and flipping making 12 and a half stone. There was nothing on me. You before. always looked massive though at 12 and a half stone. You still look big. Bro, then. man. I weren't, I was, yeah, I was bro, like that, man, bro. Yeah. I was like that when mm -hmm. it was fight fight time, man. Seriously. Yeah. Because your career get cut short as well with yeah. the, the knee injury. How oh, was that man, moment? That was that was that was that was terrible, bro. Seriously, I, I made a I made a I made a mistake. I made a bad move. Um, but you know what's weird? Because I've always had this conversation with the manufacturer of human beings. I've always talked to the creator of heaven and earth about my life because I understand that we're all made and we all have purpose. Everything we got around this room has a manufacturer. So how come we don't give ourselves that credit? Why do we come from a big bang or from a monkey or being evolved? I got an awesome creator because I'm built awesome. You're built awesome. So for me, it was about talking to God about what was happening in my life. And I talked to God about my boxing career. And um, I, I was wondering about what do I do, especially after my loss and stuff like that. I come back as a cruiser. I knock the guy out in the first round. I'm like, yes, cruise away. I'm going to kill it, smash it. Next minute, I do a little work with my brother, helping him out, doing a bit of security. Uh, as I'm out working with him, um, there's this guy, stocky little guy, 
Uh, and it looks like, because a lot of the boys used to come from country, Manchester, uh, all of that, all them sides. Um, and they used to be, they used to be on the gear and they used to come up, but they knew us. They knew the Prince brothers and we, they would always abide by what we'd say, how things were going out on the street. You can't sell merchandise there, outside the premises, whatever. We put you down there. You can make your money. So we weren't stopping from making their money. But we just allowed him to do it in a certain bit. This guy weren't having it. This guy was like, bro, you can't tell me none. <laughs> so I was like, oh, we don't need to do this. So I know what I can do on the roads. So I ain't looking to do no one nothing because I know what damage I can do. But when I put my hand out, say, bro, you can't go past this bit. A man bangs my hand and said, bro, you can't do nothing. It's on. So I'm in my head, I'm trying to prevent using these because they're licensed. So I've got other skills. So I took my man's Adam's apple and gripped it like I was taking it out to put it in the fridge, bruv. <laughs> and my man just panicked. He goes mad. He couldn't breathe. He's, as he's thrashing, trying to hit me, I take him down. So I drop him. I've done judo. I've done loads of different um, combat sports growing up, karate. They're in me. So I take him down. But when I've taken him down, my back foot hasn't turned. So my body's here, but my foot's this way. I can feel and hear the rip in my ligament, in my knee. And it's freaked me out, the pain, but I got to deal with this guy. So I can't focus on the pain. So I want him to get up and go because he can see I've got total control of him. So I give him a, a, a bang in the face and I say, bro, I could flipping kill you right here, bro. Get up and come out. Don't let me see you around there again. So he gets up and go. Um, I'm thinking he's gone. I've warned him. Don't let me see you around there. Shot him posters and all that. Don't let me see you. So I've got up. My knee's like a shaking leaf in autumn. I'm saying to my brother, I'm getting pissed now. I'm like, bro, this guy could have flipping ended my career. Listen to the words I'm saying. This guy could have ended my career with this move and I was merciful towards him and I'm getting pissed now thinking, nah, I've got to dish out some proper judgment on this brother. So we allow emotions to take over, didn't we? So I'm emotionally driven now. I've walked around thinking, all right, maybe I won't see him. He's gone. Bro, my man's still down there. Posters for sale. Bro. I've walked up to him and I'm thinking in my head, I've got the whole picture planned out. No hands, elbows, MPs, some UFC shit on him. This will end in a couple seconds. Walked up to him. We still doing it, bruv. Didn't I tell you to leave? Bang! So he's gone down. I've hit the second one. It's been like a one-two by an elbow. But the second one's missed because he's on the way down already. As he's dropping now, all of a sudden, my brother's, my bridgings that are working with me on the shift, everyone's just moved in. And everyone's on some stomp thing, bruv. They're mashing my man. So I'm trying to get everyone to stop, like, allow it, this between me and him. No one ain't listening. Everyone's freaked out, getting mad, stomping this guy. I see his head. My brain says, bang him in his face, bruv, kick him. And then the other, then another thought was, don't use your right leg. But, I, but I'm not, I'm not, that's just thoughts that are going through my head. I've used my right leg. Next minute, I'm sitting on the floor like this, thinking, why am I on the level with my guy looking at him on the floor? <laughs> so I look like this. My foot, which is supposed to be in front of me, is over here. <laughs> my, my frigging knee, when I look, is pushing out of my tracksuit. I thought it came out of the skin. So I'm screaming, my leg, my leg. The pain's kicked in. Because the pain ain't kicked in until I looked at the thing. Mm -hmm. I looked at my brother, screamed, my leg. He's looked at me and just turned his eyes because he can't look. My other brother now has come up. My younger brother's come up and he was started in uh, Kiss, Kiss, of, Kiss of the Dragon with Jet Li. That, was it that one where that, that black guy comes in with the leather jacket in the shop mm -hmm. and strips his leather jacket on? That's my brother, he's in that mm -hmm. one, yeah. Colin Prince, have a check out on that. <laughs> um, he, he comes up and he holds I'm holding the foot and I'm looking at his face saying put it back in put it back in <laughs> I'm screaming he goes you sure I'm like yeah and he's just gone bang and put it I'm like, ah! mm -hmm. luckily for me some feds have bust the corner feds bust the corner they flagged them down bro I don't know what they said to him 
and then the feds have come over and what's happened, I don't know what concert, it must have been, might have been Tina Turner's concert that night and it, there's thousands, it's like ants on the street now, they've, they've left, we're supposed to be working but obviously everyone's with me. So as everyone's pouring out the concert, coming out, the police can't, the ambulance can't get to me. So the police lift me up with all my brothers. I'm screwing my head off because every movement, even my moving my hand is hurting my flipping leg. Uh, they get me in the car, take me up, get me through the crowd, get me to the ambulance. And that's the start of my bloody nightmare. I can't believe you says put it back in. It's not a dislocated oh, shoulder. Man, it was like something out of Rambo, <laughs> bruv. Uh, and I'm that was the you. end of your career, that moment? That was it, bruv. That hmm. was it. How uh, old were 2000, you? 2000, I was, wow, I think 30 years old. So still young at, the, at your prime? Still young, bruv. Um, I was offered a fight with Johnny Nelson, bruv. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, okay, cool. Mm, 40 bags, mm, not enough. Uh, let's let's see. So I was I was I was in contact with Don King. I was in contact with Jackie Callan. I was in contact with a few oh, promoters and stuff. Yeah, in America, mm -hmm. you know, we were gonna do something. So, you know, I, 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 there, there was so much left in yeah. me to do. So, how was that obstacle? Another obstacle in your life to deal with? Oh, from gosh. the kind that you're out to make something of your life. Oh, bro, I was finished. Honestly, I thought I was done. I thought I was done. Uh, I remember I just got married. I'm at home, leg up, crutch between my nuts and my ankle. <laughs> just all I could do is I'm in this nutty pain and my legs straight. I can't even go up the stairs. I was downstairs on my settee for months. Um, even to go in the shower, had to tie up my leg with a black plastic bag just to go in the shower because uh, I was sick of having washes. Ah, man, it was so depressing. You know, I really, I was angry with God, man. I was like, man, I turned my life around. I've done all of this for this, to get to this point. You know, we want someone to blame in it. And it's easy to blame God. But it's know? only yourself yeah, yeah. to blame. It's easy to blame yeah. God. So, you know, I just blamed him for everything until I realized that, wait a minute, the one person that can actually help me, I'm, I'm turning my back on him. So, um, and that was only making me more depressed. So I had to have a re another conversation and say, okay, what now? What do I do? How do I give back? And that's when I started to have a passion in me to to want to go out and help young people. Because I realized you got something. You've been on the streets, you've been homeless, you've been through so much tough times, you know the drug runnings, you know the crime mentality, and there's loads of youths out there that are getting involved in this. Go out there and help them, you know. Get yourself done, go, go on a counselling course, go on a youth work course, get your MVQ diploma, whatever you need to do, go and do it. So I went through that process and um, I just improved my knowledge and equipped myself and gave myself more value. I recreated myself basically and went out there with, and helping youths. I didn't get the money. Obviously it's a complete different lifestyle, but I was getting satisfaction about who I was again. I was starting to be happy with me. And before that, I was broken and sad and thought I put all my significance in me as a fighter. I didn't have significance in me, the person. If I had no fighter, if I wasn't being able to fight, then I was nothing. That's what, my, that's what I told myself. That was a story I told myself. And we all tell ourselves a story that's either empowering or debilitating, uh, either limiting or, or empowering. And, and what happened is I decided to shift that, change that story, reframe that story and tell myself that, bro, this is the start of something else. You know, be great in whatever you do. So I began, and, and bro, did I stand out as a youth worker, doing counseling the kids. I created a program to train them, motivate them, help them. But little did I know this was all my training ground for what was coming in the future. I don't know what's coming in the future. Only God knows. And, 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 and I, I really loved helping young people and changing lives. And I began doing that in 2001, 2002. So you were doing all that beforehand? I was doing all yeah. that, bro, until, yeah. and that's why it was ironic for me, bruv. It was like, the youths I'm helping, 
that with that same mindset, these youths have gone and killed my boy who ain't on that shit. My boy is on focus. He's on training. He's on looking wham, being skilled, being a top um, footballer. You know, Ian Wright and them man was, was the people that he looked up to. He, he loved Arsenal and all of that. And um, he worked so hard, he got to the point where West Ham, Arsenal, uh, QPR was... was yeah. giving them offers bro so I watched actually Enjoy. the manager it was sad I've watched a lot of your videos the yeah. last few weeks and the manager came on he says when Kion walked into a room he just you knew oh. his presence was there bro. and you seen the photos at 15 he looked about 21 bro, it's, um, and you see the passion even Special with the manager guy. so at 15 you seen up and coming prodigy the day that there was a boy getting bullied and your son tried to split up the fight yeah that's exactly and right. then sadly he lost his life he got stabbed in the heart listen man <laughs> no one wants to go through that experience it's the worst nightmare of any parent and the last thing I expected was to experience the worst nightmare I already thought yeah you, you know you've gone through stuff in life don't get much worse than this I even buried my little uh, my six month premature baby in a little coffin it just so ruined me uh, and I thought, man, you know, how much more do I have to go through? But never did I think oh, I'd have to bury Kaya. And, you know, a couple of weeks earlier, we were hugging and laughing. And yeah, after the meeting with QPR, telling him that, you know, they got, they're investing time in him because he's showing an amazing promise. They're going to put him up. He was only 15. They're going to put him up with their first team and he's going to develop him and whatever. So I knew what was there for him. You know what I'm saying? We saw Rooney at 16 uh, playing against Arsenal, scoring that amazing goal. And like, I just knew that my boy just was a special guy. When parents talk to me about him, they express the same thing. Anyone that watched Kyan, his friends being around him, they knew he was he was the man. Special. How was that day when you got the phone call? Um, wow, it's, it's weird because when you get the call, stuff goes through my head anyway. And I thought, be calm. Don't lose it. Everyone's losing it. My daughter was losing it on the phone. And you, that's understandable. But I think coming from what I've been through and going through what I'd gone through, it helped my mind to think in a certain way. So I thought about calmness until I know more. Um, so I thought just try and stay calm because you got to drive down to, to, to wherever he is. And if you're all out of sorts, bruv, you might crash the car, race him, whatever. Be calm. So long story short, go through, go through down to the hospital and then you get the news about your boy. And um, no one prepares for stuff like that. Your body's not made for news like that. Your body ain't made for news like that, bro. Um, so I, something switched in me where for a while I was not in control of myself. Um, I remember punching the walls at the hospital and my, my, my hands were in a mess, bruv. Um, there was blood when I, I didn't even know. I didn't know because I couldn't feel anything. I was numb. Um, and they had to clean up the blood that was trailing when I was walking. I remember some feds. I'd never seen a fed that big. He was, I was like, would this guy work in some mad gym or something? He was massive, bruv. And they were trying to hold me, bro. They, I just heard him say, I just heard him say let's, let, let's leave him, let him go. You couldn't hold me. You couldn't do, you couldn't control me. I just lost it. I was doing mad jump kicks. It was crazy. So I lost my mind hearing that and listening to the noise coming out of Tracy and hearing noise coming out of myself that I'd never heard before. Um, wailing and screaming. Uh, and I got short little images of just, just you know, people just kind of looking at us and I, uh, uh, and then going in to see him in, in the room, um, bro, um, that's never, ever going to um, leave leave my head. That that feeling of just seeing him looking peaceful and then looking at his arms, you could see the, the knife where he'd been trying to block it. Um, and just one got through in his heart, just one. And that always amazed me because I had a mate that got stabbed 14 times, died twice on the operating table, got stabbed in his heart more than once. Like, yeah, so crazy things in life, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Just, you, you, you don't make sense. 
But if we spend time trying to make sense of stuff, it'll drive you nuts. Mm -hmm. You gotta walk your journey. You just gotta move forward. And obviously the first start of my journey was just filled with anger and revenge. I just wanted to kill, bro. You know, I'm this, I'm this uh, named fighter. I'm, you know, I, I, I can't let people, you know, look at me and think, what, you know, he didn't do nothing. We just let man kill your son. You know, those are the things that go through your, your head. You not only got your own demons, put a pressure in you, you got the thoughts of how, what people are gonna say in your head as well. So I had to deal with those outside and then before I could start dealing with Yeah, with the me. outside noise, but I think that the shows you your noise. character, how you've handled it. There's no way that people can say you handled it well, you've done this, but you've handled it so bravely that you're now helping change, not just one life, thousands of lives. You're now on the path to accept in life it's like mm -hmm. I had a friend stabbed 18 times he survived and then my uncle got stabbed two years ago once died um, 18 times survived and then my uncle wow. stabbed once and died and also wow. you do feel that pain the misery the, the trauma is always there no mm -hmm. matter how successful you become yeah. or how many books you write mm -hmm. it's a battle every day the a pain is there but day. that shows you how strong we are as characters yeah. to then you know go know what fuck the outside noise yeah. I've been through fights my whole life and it's constant but what you've done now to achieve the greatness that you've done, you should be proud. Even your missus here today, it's yeah. unbelievable how far you've come to now. Your word and message is getting spread, not just throughout the country, but the world now. It's powerful how come, stuff. How come I don't feel like that? Yeah, because we're constantly battling. How come I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't. You know, people always say, are oh, you proud of all the stuff you've done? And I try, I try to be, but, but. You're I'm still just, numb. Bro, like every day is a new day. My battle is with staying committed. Yeah. My battle is staying committed to, to what I'm doing, what I'm passionate about, because your emotions can easily have you just cotching in the bed, doing nothing, letting the day pass. Uh, you have not being productive. But, but, but that's actually my way of being able to keep going, you know, is being productive. Um, setting new goals, trying to achieve new things. So, you know, I, I, I want to do a podcast. Uh, I've started putting together to do a series. Uh, I'm working to do a five-part series. Uh, we're, we're doing, there's so many things that I'm focused on. Sometimes I think, Pete, what are you doing? Can you even do all these things? Like some things that I really want to impact young people and teach. Because there's a model, there's, there's a way, there's a strategy and a system for getting through life. And if you look at all the successful people, they all share, you know, common things. Success in their leaves clues. Character. There's, yeah. Exactly. So they always you leave things in their character, but people talk about talent. We give too much credence to talent. Oh, you're so talented. Bro, talent ain't shit, bro. Mm -hmm. Talent ain't shit. If you don't know how to utilize this mind, how to get your head right and stay focused. Do you know how much talented brothers that I've seen that look like Sugar Ray Leonard, bro? That like, even my brother, the, one, some of the fastest hands I've seen is from my older brother. It takes more than talent. My trainer taught me, bro, you think you got talent? You didn't say one ten, you got talent. I said, someone that works harder than you is going to come in that ring and he's going to break you down. Yeah. And that got to me. I was like, what? What, someone that just works hard? I said, well, I'm going to work hard then. I'm going to work really hard. So that mindset stayed with me. Like, are you working hard enough? So when people say, you're doing so well, you're doing this, and I don't feel like that. Because in my own walking life, I'm feeling like, P, you can do better than this, you know? You can do more than this. You're not focused enough. You're not driven enough. You're not keeping yourself on point. You could be doing more, bro. Mm -hmm. That's what my mind... Constantly looking for improvement. Constantly. It's bro. not if you find the fulfillment. We'll never be truly fulfilled, but it's to keep raising the bar. I interviewed a billionaire man, and he says it as well, that... He gets people coming to his seminars, have read hundreds of books, thousands of books. Yeah. But he says they've not made, he says they can be the most educated person in the world, but when it comes to the first obstacle, the Boom. first speed bump. So even Boom. before you were a kid, people yeah. would have just end up becoming maybe a junkie or yeah. an alcoholic. Yeah, got you. The fact that you've 
obstacle after yeah. obstacle shows me that you're placed on this earth for a reason. That's correct. You have been chosen to go through all the fucking trauma and pain Bro, every single day. Doesn't it also show you that it's about choice? Yeah. And it's not about, yeah, but you're like this though. You're all right. I used to get, yeah, but you box, you got discipline. Bullshit, bro. Every time I wake up, the same voice that told you not to get up, to stay in bed, to relax, you're tired. Yesterday you put the work in, don't do nothing today, is the same voice I hear in my head yeah. that says, stay in the bed, bro. Oh, that person said that about you. Don't even bother with them no more. Don't forgive them. This and that person done that. Bun them, bruv. Oh, they done that. Hurt them. The same voices, I go through it. The same internal battle, the battlefield of the mind, I have to go through it. The only thing that separates me from anybody else is the choice that I make. Yeah, and the actions that you do. The choice, bro. Who was it then? Was it a 16-year-old boy? Yeah. To, how was that when yeah. go to court and stuff and oh, the, the memories and the pain mad, then mad mad bro like going in and you learn so much about the justice system it's bullshit bro it, it don't look after people that have been through stuff as soon as I say that they know what I'm talking about because I was with other people and learned about other cases and they were suffering in the same and there's many little things it's almost like they look out more and care for the perpetrator and what is happening to him and how he feels than, than the people that have been impacted by his vicious, heartless actions. Um, and, you know, they cared about where he's sitting. You know, don't put him to sit there. Let's put him over there because it must be really terrible for him to experience this, to put him in the docks. So let's put him, like, bullshit, bro. You stepped up and done something heinous. Now, I know your background is messed up, but let's still deal with consequences to what you've done. We can focus on helping you once you start facing the consequences of what you've done. Now we can bring healing to the process. But you've got to step up to it, bro. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, if I go and, well, and outside my marriage, I want to be banging girls and someone gets pregnant, then I've got to deal with all the consequences of that. Now I've got to be having my missus on me and now I've got to be dealing with another child from another... It's all a mess, but we've got to deal with it. You got to accept what you've done, who you are, embrace it. How can you change it? What can you learn from it? How can you grow from it? And unless people face their consequences first, they are not going to be able to go on to the next stage of growth, bro. Yeah. Have you ever reached out to that kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, yeah is there yeah, any yeah. replies or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reached out. Uh, I reached out through Cats 22, the charity. They had their restorative justice arm visiting me, visiting him. Uh, he agreed. They gave him excerpts from the pet, the book, let him read. Um, he was shocked that I wanted to, to see him um, and, and, and sit down in the same room with him and talk to him. And uh, But he agreed. Um, he, he's messed up himself, this you. It's like he's stuck in time, stuck in a time warp of what's happened to him with Kyan. And he also seemed like he hasn't, like he's got some sort of, behavioural or psychological issues with the way he uh, interacts with you. It's like he, like he don't quite get it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I, I needed to be able to see him. Like, you can't stick a knife in my boy's chest, take him away from the family, and I don't get to sit and have a conversation. If another kid punched my ute in his face and, and they had a ruck and they, he hurt him and put him in hospital, you know, come to the hospital and see what you've done. See, you know, be sorry if that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to meet the family. You're going to have to, you know, step up to what you've done. And I'm saying to him, he hasn't had the opportunity to do that. I want to see you. I want to see you, bro. Explain to me what was going on in your heart and in your mind. Explain to me the lead up to that. Why you felt it right to be able to do that. Yeah, and what's going on since then? What's happening with you? What, what process are you going through? What's going through here? What's going on in here, bro? You know, I want to have that conversation with him. And, and I have the right to be able to want to do that. And the system should be able to make that available to me to be able to talk to the perpetrator who impacted my family so badly. How was that moment then? I didn't get it. Oh, did it not happen? No, the, the system put did a stop to, to it. He to do it, that kid? Bro, he was up for it. He was that would, up do you think that would have helped you not get closure, but understanding why? 
I just want to. I just want to understand a little bit more from his point of view. Yeah, it's not gonna not gonna give me any closure. Mm -hmm. the, the them sentencing him to life and telling me he has to do thirteen years before he's eligible for for, um, parole. parole didn't give me closure. Mm -hmm. It was just like okay, the guy got thirteen years. Was I happy about the thirteen years? Of course not. My son's fifteen. He didn't even get one year each for my son's life. That's a violation, bro. Yeah. So the boy's out soon. Yeah. Well, he's supposed to be. But um, they've been contacting me, talking to me about it, asking me to write in statements for the parole board, whatnot. Um, but I'm still saying, bro, I need to see this guy. They pulled the plug. The system pulled the plug on it in the last week. I went back and forth for a year. Do you think that was easy for me? Talking to these people, listening to them, going through emotions and all of that. Were you able to control your emotions sitting across with them? Listen, bro, I've been able to control my emotions through up to date. I've been 15 years in. It'll be a different ball game meeting him, but let's see how the ball game works. Yeah. And if I can't control my emotions, there'll be people in there to control me. Mm -hmm. So what? So yeah. what? Let's do it, man. So brave, brother. I'm going to, you're, what you're doing is unbelievable. Even Loftus Road, that they changed their name oh, for nuts. Kayan just last year is, is unbelievable how nuts, somebody can change bro. the stadium's nuts. name. I've seen all the fans and yeah. you get 63% of the vote. Which is mega. Yeah, it's massive. That's massive. Some it's, great charities. Yeah. Yeah, even Grenfell was in mm -hmm. there. Some wonderful So after charities. doing all that and going through that pain and torment, how was your life then? What Then you started really wanting to help kids and understand the yeah. knife crime. Do you know what? It was so basic and raw. It was like, okay. Because um, I had a moment. I had another breakthrough moment. And once again, it wasn't with a counsellor. It wasn't with a therapist. It was with the manufacturer of me, of human beings, the creator of heaven and earth. I cried out to him because I was broken. Two court cases, couldn't find this boy guilty. I was broken. One of the court cases, when you read the book, you'll find I said something to a juror who was taking the piss and, and they, they threw the case out. So we had to do another case. It was a third court case before we got any form of justice. And... Um, Basically, I had this conversation with God where I was like, I was so broken. I'd never seen so many tears. And you can imagine, I've, I know how to cry now. But I'm broken. I'm crying. There's a puddle on the floor. Like how all this water's dripping. It was way more than that. I was just break. And I cried out to God like, like, what now? I give up. I'm... Bruv, I was so plagued from revenge and anger that it felt like it was, it was taking my life. The, my life force was being sucked out of me because I was dreaming about killing him, waking up, you know, thoughts have come through my head during, I'm talking to you, but I'm thinking about killing Hannah. You, know, you don't even know. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's driving me, giving me that force, that false energy. That's what anger does. It gives you this false energy that you're powerful and you're this when it ain't. And I found out how powerful love and forgiveness was because I changed roads when I cried to God and said, I give, I can't take this, I can't do this. What do you want from me? What do you want me to do? It was like, when I said I, I give up, I can't take this, it was like a weight, bro, a weight. I felt light. I stopped crying at that moment. It's like something happened, but I didn't know what happened, but I could tell you that something happened. I felt something, it was real. And uh, I just finished talking to the maker. So it was like, okay, <sighs> okay, let's see how this goes. When I go into court, I start seeing the conversation manifesting itself because before in, at court every day, man was like this. Like I was looking at, I was looking at people like their, his Hannah's family like this, like looking at his dad like, I beg you say something, I beg you look wrong, look wrong. I'll slap the bitch out your your mum, everything, bro. So I'm thinking his mad thoughts every day. I go in this time, and I'm like this, bro. I'm just calm. You know, things are going on in court. I'm not even responding like I was that bastard. How yeah, could he say that? You know, I'm just like this. Tracy's like talking. I'm just like, it's all right. It's going to be all right, Trace. And in my head, I'm thinking, what the hell? So I've like continued letting things go. And then I get invitations to speak. So the first thing is in my head, I'm a fighter. I ain't a speaker. That's not what I do. In fact, 
I shit myself to go up in a front of a crowd that are looking at me, gawping at me. What's he got to say? What's he got to say? And I'm going to talk. I don't know what, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm too scared. My, my hands get clammy. My mouth gets dry. Like I'm starting to like just freeze up. But I thought, I remember that conversation I had and I thought, uh, let me just go with what's happening. So I went with what was presenting itself to me. You want me to talk? So when I do this talk, kids, parents, everyone's coming to me, kids are coming to me, parents are coming to me, hugging me. And I'm like, wow, they got something from this? Like, this is, there may be something in this. So I'm always scared when I go out to speak, but I'm doing it anyway. So I'm doing, and it's coming to me. I'm not going to try to be a speaker. It's coming to me. Emails are coming to me. Media's coming to me. So I'm like, just go with it. Just go with it. Bro, what, 15 years later, bro? Mm -hmm. 15 years later, I'm here. Kyan Prince Foundation's here. I just wanted to be, when I thought about a charity, I wanted it there so I could be a dad to other children like I was a dad to Kyan. You know, Trace was a great mum to Kyan, as you can see how we turned out. And I was a great dad to Kyan, as you can see how we turned out. I wanted to continue this by doing it to other children, because I realized you have got pains like me when I was a youth. They're suffering with stuff like I was. People don't get it. I know what it's like to buy into the road mindset. I know what it's like to believe that I want money. I want, I want to have good things as well. But how am I going to get it? I ain't educated. I ain't got this. I ain't got that. There's a way to get it. I'm going to teach you how. Here's the blueprint. So I then have to go inside myself and understand how I done this. How did I do this and break it down, package it, and put strategies on it, and I realized it was about here. So I went more to study, to understand psychology, understand how our mind works, you know, uh, just doing life coaching and understanding strategies. How do you help someone to overcome their fears? How do you get them to start moving into action, to lead fulfilling lives, purpose-filled lives? How do you do that? And there's a way. There's a blueprint for success and I wanted to give it to the young people and give it to anyone who had ears to listen to yeah. truth. And you're doing that, brother. This is and what I'm saying. Sometimes on. we're the pawn and the maker, whoever creates us to say, right, those cards you're getting dealt, why? Because you're strong enough to play them. Yeah. So sometimes it's not about why me, you know yourself, it's about fucking try me. It's um, it's all you got, man. Yeah, and it's sometimes all you can do is push forward and crack Use on. what you yeah. got. Because I'm inspired just listening to your story yeah. and I have a lot of hard-hitting stories, but your story resonates. Yeah. There's something about you. There's a glow about you. There's a twinkle in your eye where yeah. you're fucking ready. You can still see that. Yeah. You're still fighting, you're battling, but you can also see the presence where you're here to change lives, mm. you're here to create and change the game. You're on yeah. everything like you say as a blueprint. You can change the way you think, you can change you the can. way you feel, you can choose your own life, your own destiny now from the present moment and the future. Yeah, life bro. is beautiful, but it's also a roller coaster. Right. There's some crazy shit goes on as your prime yeah. example, but yeah. You're still here to tell your story. Right, 15 man. years later, you've got the book out. Mm -hmm. Your Instagram's popping where people yeah. are connecting. Even us sitting here today, it's all synchronicity. It's all here for oh, a reason. Beautiful. You got your OB as well. How did yeah. that come about? It was nuts. I just, I went to my mum's. I'm always at my mum's. That's that's my joint, being at my mum's house. God rest her soul. Um <sighs> She went in July, man. Sorry for your loss, brother. She'll be proud, man. Yeah. Mum went in July and um, a letter came to my mum's and I just opened the letter. I saw like some official stamp majesty and whatever. I was thinking, oh, yo, what they after me for? <laughs> yeah. I ain't got nothing for you. you. Can't get blood out of a stone. So I just opened it and I just see them giving me something. I was like, "What mm -hmm. the hell?" You know, mm -hmm. I said, "This is gonna blow mummy's mind" because you know she's been over here, hard working, wind rush generation, gone through a lot of shit, taken a lot of shit from the country and from people, but still just been a beautiful person and never been down to, you know, uh, a tourist, in, in, you know, where tourists go in London, Buckingham Palace, never done all that. So 
you know, to be able to go there, but this time pass everyone at the gate, mm -hmm. drive in and take her inside was beautiful um, for me, um, knowing what that meant for my mum, you know. Um, so, so that was a beautiful experience and I know that was a proud moment for my mum. Um, yeah, that was just awesome, the OBE. Because um, people, because of the way I see life, And I don't put so much value on things like I used to when I was younger. You know, you, you want things, everyone's got things, and it looks great, so you want it. But I realize that you want it because not for the things, what you think it's gonna do for you. You think getting that's gonna make you happier. Getting that's gonna give you that joy that you're looking for. The external in life. stuff. Yeah, it's not. That's why so many people with money and everything, you find, why are they doing that in their life? Why are they unhappy? Because um, the things don't make you yeah. happy. We look at Tyson you know? Fury. He ended up in his Senior. biggest. He ended up in his biggest depression ever That's when he right. won his titles won and the they won, had all the money. Perfect example, yeah. man. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. And now look at him, mm -hmm. full of joy, full of life. Yeah, he struggles with his stuff, and like everyone's going to struggle. But I, I really want people to get this. How can people get the book? Uh, you can get the book on Amazon. Uh, you can get the book on. We will leave all the links in the description yeah, for people. Yeah, please, you can get the book on Amazon. I'm trying to contact Trinity Mirror because it's coming like them. They sold out. Someone told me that they couldn't get it. I had to get mm -hmm. it secondhand on Amazon. I was like, no, no, no. Trinity Mirror need to pay yeah. it up. So Trinity Mirror, get a new load. People are looking to buy the book all the time. Um, so we're going to sort that out. But I do want people to follow. I'm yeah. trying to get the message out mm -hmm. that you have got great value. You've got great purpose in you. You probably haven't lived out your full potential. There's so much more in you to give and you're going to find purpose through that pain. I know everyone's going through so much anxiety, so much stress, so much problems in here and they're all up in themselves. They're all up in the problem because that, that blinds them to, they're not able to see that there's a better way, that there's another way. There is. And if you could just look outside of you, if you could do the simplest of things and go to help your neighbor, go to help someone. There's so much people in deeper shit than wearing. You know, there was a, everyone, I used to hear these voices in the family crying, oh, why me? Why our family? Why Kyan? Well, why not us? Why not Kyan? Why not our family? Why can't, some other family is going to be suffering with their child being lost. Why can't it be me? Why can't it be you? Why can't it be us that are going through the worst shit? But if we can dig deep within ourselves. Because it's in us to find that, that ability to say, I will never give up. I will continue going. I'm going to find why I'm here and I'm going to give back. And even if you can't, sharing your story is the most powerful thing that you can do. People need to hear that you made it. It will give them a license to keep going. Yeah. And we need to love mm. each other, bro. Yeah. This hating on each other, this jealous of each other, this step on each other for power, titles, all of that, bro. F all the titles, bro. It means nothing. I got honorary doctorate, Dr. Mark Prince OB. Sounds great. But at the end of the day, it's not me. I am who I am, what I give to you, the love I show to you. That's what people are going to remember when I go. They won't remember the titles and all of that, any money that I made. No one, I've never seen no one at a eulogy talking about your bank balance, bro, because it don't mean shit now. Yeah, definitely. What are you going to give back, bro? Mm. What are you going to do for others? Yeah, How are you going to use your yeah, pain? And I think it's good that you're utilising your pain for strength because yeah. we're in a world where there's over 7 billion people in it. It's not a place where, it should be a place of love and kindness. We're all in the same race. People yeah, are tripping each other bro. up though to try and finish further. And all that's the scary same. thing. It's the time, will we ever see a, a, a peaceful life in our lifetime? I don't think so. But if we can plant the seeds and try and help, now, I don't know what I'm doing either. I, I wing this shit. Yeah. But I just know it's, what I'm doing feels good for me. I'm not, yeah. I'm not harming anyone. That's I'm trying it. to spend powerful messages. Even you yeah. today, I'm actually inspired by your story, brother. And oh, I don't awesome. say that often. It's, um, I think it's phenomenal how far you've come. I think from even being a kid from the court, yeah. you've been constantly battling. You've constantly had that fucking fight 
our flight, our freeze mode, mm. you are fighting, but for Trust. the right reasons to create change, to create positivity, to yeah. create awareness, yeah. and you'll change other lives. People come up to you and say, you helped my son, you helped me, because we all fucking struggle. Every day I battle, I struggle, I cry myself. Certain songs will, will bring tears to my eyes. Even you can see the emotion for yourself, but we do not shy away from it. We don't yeah. promote ourselves as saints and fucking, we yeah, are sinners as well. We just do bad shit but we're trying to do the right things now to try and help other people and it's for what you're doing is unbelievable listen they feel we've got to change the narrative yeah. it's always been about showing off bling it's always been about what I got the money boom boom the champagne all bullshit bro yeah that's lies. We're feeding a generation of young people with bullshit lies, man. Tell them the truth. Tell them what it takes to get through shit. Tell them what it takes to keep going every day. Tell them what it takes, the discipline you're going to need to make it in anything that you want in life. And it's never easy. Mm -hmm. It's not even getting there. It's staying there. You know, you could get there as a world champ. Can you stay there as a world champ? You know, this life is a constant battle. Equip young people, equip people who are going to turn into adults with the ammunition, the strategies to be able to love people, to not look at you and look at the differences. Well, what's different between you and me, bro? You're white, I'm black, your culture, are you different from mine, your religion? Forget all of that, bro. The same heart I got, you got. The same blood is red, I got, you got. The same cut you feel, I feel when I get cut, bruv. The same hurt you feel when a girl distresses you, when you have broken relationship with your friends, distresses you, and family's not there for you, when you ain't got a dad, you ain't got a mum, when you've been abused. The same things hurt us all. Mm. So how come we're getting upset? I see a Twitter thing, people getting upset because Sainsbury's got black people on the advert. Who gives a shit, bruv? We're doing Doing all this flipping knee down on the on the in the park, bro. Get up, stand up, stand up, bro. Stand up and get people on the decision making table of color because all of us are the same. Forget all of this separation with culture and colors, bro. We yeah. need to start loving each other, and that's when things change. We need to start wishing each other well. We need to start picking each other up when we're down. That's when shit's gonna change, bro. Yeah. Not because you know all of this and I don't. Not because I'm like this and you're not. Yeah, it's the divide and conquer though, isn't it? That's what oh, the division man, is. And I just you touched on it day. there, like, it's easy to make it, but it's hard to maintain oh. because it's all about lifting the bar and levels. When they, you got a decision for, when Loftus Road changed his name, how yeah. was that moment 15 years later to walking by the stadium, Kayan's name's on the shirts oh, on the stadium. Bro. That must have been another moment for you. <sighs> wow, man, I'll tell you. When I first came out of the car and um, I was looking at that, I, I was in uncontrollable emotion. I couldn't stop crying, bruv. Just flooded out of me and my son. Cause remember I was out there with my boy, hugging him like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sign with QPR, boom. What a decision we made. Cause Arsenal wanted him. Mm -hmm. I loved Arsenal. But, you know, we were both supporters of Arsenal. Arsenal wanted him to sign him. But we sat down and thought, who's going to do the best job with Cayenne? And we looked at QPR's uh, whole resume on how they deal with young academy players. And we said, they're going to look after our son. And what a great decision. See, you don't even know how your decisions are going to impact on future life. I don't know if Arsenal would have done that for my boy. Changed the name of huh? the stadium? Nah, I don't Can think you so. imagine mm -hmm. the Emirates with, with kind of, nah, mate, mm. nah, mate. You know, they talked about um, raising money. I think Arsene Wenger was a guy at the time and um, I, 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 and I sat with him as well. He's my guy, I love him. The guy that brought, that brought in uh, Dean, um, something Dean or, yeah, he, he brought in Arsene. I talked to him, he was the chairman of Arsenal. And, um, but I, I didn't meet him at the time. I've met him recently. But before that, Arsenal was going to raise some money for Cayenne. And that didn't happen. So what I'm trying to say is, many people along my journey have talked the talk, but ain't walked the walk. And I've never had any negative feelings towards them because that's life. Just keep it moving. But I love QPR because they stepped up, bro, from day one. 
They've stepped up. From day one, they've shown my son love. So we, me and Tracy, we made the right choice, getting him into the right club. And, and it's, all about, it's all about loving and supporting and being connected to the people that are really showing you genuine love by doing and not by talking. We love saying, I love you. We done for me lately, bro. Mm -hmm. uh, we done for me lately. I know you love me. You know what I'm saying? You you can't bring your kids up on I love you. You understand me? You gotta fill that you with knowledge and action to show them how it's done in life. How do you deal with anger issues? How do you deal with depression? You gotta show your you. They're watching you. They ain't listening to what you tell them. You say listening to what you tell them. Be good, get your lessons done, do this. Now, nah, mate, what are you doing? Come off your phone, study, read a book. What are you doing? I ain't seen you reading no book, mum. I ain't seen you reading no book, dad. What are you doing? Show me. And even if they don't follow what you've shown them, you can always stand up and say, I showed you. I showed you how this is done. You didn't need to go your route because I didn't tell you. I showed you. And that's what changed my life. I realised I can't be on road and expect my you to now become the top businessman, the top athlete, to be great and successful when I've showed him road mentality and road life. And I'm gonna be saying, yeah, I'm gonna be making paper so my boy lives a different life. Bullshit, bruv, you're fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. So through all that, you're clearly a man who puts their mind to something to achieve it. What's yeah. your plans for the future, brother? Bro, we, we gotta get this out. I, my thing is a generation needs to see a whole different narrative. So when they turn on the TV, they need to see all these bullshit lies that the music industry uses to project through their music. Uh, they need to see truth. Um, so I want to be dealing with a series um, that's going to uh, mirror image a lot of the stuff that's going in my life. Uh, we're doing a cartoon, putting it together right now so we can get our audience to young people. That's going to hit. That's going to hit us very soon as well. Uh, what else is going on, babe? What else is going on? What are we doing at the moment? There's, podcast there's, coming there's up as well. Podcast, mm -hmm. brilliant. We'll help promote that and stuff as well. Yeah, we can awesome. leave descriptions, even tell you what equipment and stuff we use. That's excellent. Um, the podcast, mm -hmm. look, at, look at the powerful reach that you're able to do and inspiring people with mm -hmm. what you're doing. So, so th these are the things that it's a game changer. It's a future. Why? Because the way they've shifted things and locked us down with COVID, um, the way they've done this is where we've now got to shift our mindset. If you're someone sitting down getting depressed and anxiety about COVID, then my friend, you better think again. You better shift with what's going on because it would be great if everyone was in uni with that mindset to be able to get up and say, no, I don't agree. These ain't laws. We don't agree with these guidelines. We want to do something about it. If we're not going to do that, then that the very least you can do is decide to recreate yourself because they're shutting down your business. They're stopping you from getting out. Uh, they're trying to stop you from getting the fresh air that God has provided us with that will impact on your health. So at the end of the day, we got to make decisions that are best for us. And the decision I'm making is to shift, go online, get out there because the world's online. Let's reach them yeah. and teach them. It's a massive audience and you Woo! can build the platform. I'm inspired, brother. And anybody that's maybe watching, that's maybe lost a loved one, a yeah. son, what advice would you give for them? People who are maybe going through the struggle in the battle. Yeah. A lot of people are struggling yeah. just now, but Very for a man so. who's definitely lived the pain, you're still constantly yeah. pushing forward. That's so right. what advice would you give for those in the struggle? Uh, cry, cry, um, get, get the tears out, uh, but don't get lost in it. Oh my gosh. It's like a, it's like a demon trying to hold you and restrain you because it knows what you could do with that pain. I feel my pain daily. What can I do with it? The demon don't want to let you go. So he, he grabs you and says, man, unforgiveness is sweet. Let's stay in this place. Grief, you get so used to it. You just want to stay there. It's comfy. It's like a warm quilt, baby. Let's stay here. No, the same way as you got to get up in the morning where you don't feel like it. Break free from the chains that that demon of flipping grief and sorrow and anger and unforgiveness and fear and anxiety is holding you because it knows you are powerful beyond measure if you ever break out and say and decide 
I'm gonna do something with my life. I'm gonna make something of myself. I'm gonna do what I love to do in life. When you do that, bro, the chains are broke. And when you do that the next day and the next day, because some people think, I said it once, it's all over, it's done. And when they feel it again, they're like, oh, I just keep going back. It's worth the fight, baby. It's worth the fight. Fight for what you are valued on and the value that people can get from you. You're worth the fight, man. Yeah, I love it, brother. Fight, Where can man. people contact you? Instagram, Twitter, yeah, Mark definitely. Prince OBE. What's yep. all your links and stuff? Yeah, Mark Prince OBE on Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I don't use it as much as I use the others. Uh, the website, you can find out uh, what we're doing on there. Yeah, can you send us those links so we can yes, put it I in can. the description in this? Certainly, we can do that. Um, please support, get the book, understand the story. Um, I just believe that I look at a lot of platforms and I think to myself, okay, great. People got hundreds, thousands, millions of followers. But what are you giving to the people? And then I look at a lot of people who are giving their heart to the people and I see a different number of followers. So I think that we're conditioned in a way to kind of like go for things that are just entertaining. That's an ass. Not deep yeah. things that are changing, life changing. Yeah, As you trying, said, yeah. it's like a tits and ass mindset. Yeah. <laughs> you just want that gratification <laughs> right there. So yeah. people get big yeah. just from coming on with a new set of big ass, a new yeah. set of big tits, you know, show it a bit, some clothes, some money, whatever, spit some bars, boom, boom, boom. But what real value do I get from investing as your follower? Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to rethink that as well because we could be conditioned in that way of course. to just go for quick yeah. entertainment yeah. instead of real value. Yeah, and I think the world is waking up. I believe there is a big shift happening. I believe that we're in a place just now, but I do feel change. I do feel that we can create big enough platforms, telling your story, my story, just to create awareness and other people come forward and think, okay, he thinks that, that's yeah. good, that I'm not alone. Yeah. And that's the, the main thing is human beings, no matter how bad you are from boxing, karate, yeah. judo, yeah. we are still vulnerable as fuck. Bro, we I'm still battling. You, I'm telling you, I got a battle all the time. Yeah. Yes, and I was breathing, <sighs> sucking it in, man, come and just testing yeah. me yesterday, boy. I thought, mmm. Yeah. I just want to unleash on this brother, man. And yeah. I just had to breathe it out. And then so glad I did. Because then a different feeling came about me. I allowed myself to think. Mm -hmm. And what happens, so many of us react right when we're in the emotion. Give yourself time to think. Breathe. I had a man, Wim Hof, on just last week. We went to Amsterdam. And yeah. It's all about the breathing techniques. His breathing yeah. techniques are changing the world. So when you get angry, the brain release will cort ah. will release cortisol and that's when we'll act instead of taking 10, you 20 go. deep breaths. You you'll go. think more better and you'll think that's mm, it. it's not really worth it. Trust me. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Uh, I just want to think. Uh, finish up on love. The power of love, man. Mm -hmm. Because we think where we, we just get, we get, we get hard on about being hard, you know. <laughs> we, you know, oh, you know, he's so hard, he's so tough, and all of that. But you want to be really tough, bro. Love someone, love mm. the unlovable, forgive the unforgivable. You want to be really tough? Try that shit. Now that's an expression of love. Mm. So I have to promote love wherever I go. That you uh, do a random act of kindness. That you. Uh, let things go where you think, you know what? I need to make you know this. I need to make you feel this. Let it go. And feel the power that you get from not acting on your emotion, but acting on your choice that you understand is better than your emotion that's just driving you. Amazing, brother. Marky boy, listen, for coming on today and telling your story. Uh, Normally after an interview, I'm quite drained, but... I feel inspired by you. I think Excellent. what you're doing is fucking phenomenal. I think this is only the start of your journey and I believe yeah. that massive things are coming your way and I think, and do you know what? You deserve it, brother. Oh, thank are you, you fucking deserve it. Yeah. So God bless you. Much Thanks for love. making the trip. And all the listeners and yeah. all your followers, man. May God they continue you, to support you, Thank brother. you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.